Portions of AquaKids have been produced with the cooperation of the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. As our Great Lakes adventure continues, we're now in Cable, Wisconsin at the Forest Lodge Ecological Center to see what happens when groups of people are able to come together to make a significant impact. It's great to have AquaKids here at Forest Lodge on the Shawamiga Nicolay National Forest. We're working with partners in order to develop this 872-acre historic site as an ecological campus. The buildings at Forest Lodge are one of the best remaining suites of uh, rustic architecture buildings that use log and stone in order to mimic nature. Uh, here on this part of the Schwamgen Nicolay National Forest, all of what you see is uh, second growth timber. This building, the gatehouse, was the first of the buildings here at Forest Lodge that we've restored to a usable standard. What were the standards to re in restoring them? Well, we have to follow the Historic Preservation Act standards and also the Architectural Barriers Act. So we have to restore these buildings historically, but then also make them accessible for people with disabilities like me. Jason, what was the original purpose of this building? Well, this building, when it was built back in about 1928, was for housing a caretaker that remained on site 24-7 all year round. So this is the greenhouse building here at Historic Forest Lodge. It was built we believe back in the late 1930s. It used to be that they grew all the vegetables and flower plants for the entire estate, and they started them here in this building. So time for a little safety talk while we're here at Forest Lodge, it's the historic site. Um, beware of uneven footing, and if we have inclement weather today, I'll conduct you to uh, one of the basements as a storm shelter. Uh, we haven't lost anybody yet. As long as they stick with me, they're all right. All right, uh, I'll stick with you. Very good. The next building that we're going to visit is the guest house. This was built in the early 1930s to house the friends and relatives of the family that wanted to come up here and experience a natural retreat in northern Wisconsin. As you look around, you see all these beautiful trees. It's important to remember that this is actually second growth forest. Uh, the northern half of Wisconsin was logged off back in the 1890s and early 1900s. This is the great hall of the guest house. It's an exquisite room and it's very unusual. The great hall here at the guest house at Forest Lodge was designed unlike any other room I've been in. Uh, most of the rooms that we inhabit keep the outdoors out and the indoors in and us indoors with it. In this case, this room was designed to bring the outdoors in and to link a person with nature. We believe that major ecological agreements are going to happen in this room. It's kind of like the independence hall of nature, isn't it? It is. So this morning you traveled down from Lake Superior, which is 45 minutes north of Forest Lodge. When you did that, you crossed the Great Divide. So this body of water, beautiful Lake Namakagan, is actually one of the headwaters of the Mississippi River. From here it flows into the Namakagan River, then it flows into the St. Croix system, into the Mississippi, and into the Gulf of Mexico. We've got about four miles of undeveloped shoreline here, 800 acres of beautiful forest land, and it's important to note that that beautiful, healthy forest land is what keeps the water in a lake like this clean and usable. It's been really great having AquaKids here at Forest Lodge. Thank you for having us, we really appreciate it. But there's one more thing I'd like to talk about. Throughout our tour, you mentioned a lot about having partners. Who exactly are your partners? Well, the Shawamiga Nicolay National Forest is very fortunate to be joined by Northland College, uh, the Environmental Liberal Arts College in Ashland, Wisconsin. Their Burke Water, Freshwater Center for Innovation, which is co-located in Ashland and here at Forest Lodge. We're also joined by the State Historical Society, the Cable Natural History Museum, and local groups like the Bayfield Master Gardeners and the Boy Scouts. Well, thank, I thank all those partners and you, because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be standing here in this beautiful place. And we'll be right back with more on our Great Lakes adventure. 
Now it's time for Aqua Quiz with your host, Drew Cruz. I'm your host, Drew Cruz, and it's time to test your knowledge with another Aqua Quiz. Wetlands are critical to our ecosystem. Can you name the four main types of wetlands? Is it A, marsh, mere, swamp, and bog? B, marsh, mudflat, fens, and swamp? Or C, marsh, swamp, bog, and fens? I'll have the answer after the break. Welcome back. Do you know the four main types of wetlands? The answer is C, marsh, swamp, bog, and fens. Almost every country in the world possesses a wetland of some type. Some are seasonally aquatic and some are seasonally terrestrial. All play a vital role for humans and nature alike. Wetlands provide the world with nearly two thirds of its fish harvest. We'll see you next week with another Aqua Quiz. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Before we get back to our Great Lakes adventure, I wanted to point out that we are here at the Great Divide, which is a very important location. Jason, can you tell us a little more? I can. Uh, it's actually rather amazing. Water that falls as precipitation on this side of the Great Divide goes into the Lake Superior watershed, the Lake Superior Basin, one of the most important freshwater systems in the world. And precipitation that falls on this side of where we're standing goes into the Upper Mississippi, another one of the major uh, freshwater systems in the world. As our Great Lakes adventure continues, we're now at the Namakagan Fen. You can say that three times fast. And we're about to explore this interesting wetland community. Let's go check it out. Hey guys, we're supposed to be meeting Emily out here, so we have to find her. Hey Emily, how are you? We Great. didn't see you there. How are you? We're good. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, why is the ground like this? <laughs> that's a great question. You are standing on a floating mat of vegetation. That's a characteristic of a lot of fens and bogs because the ground actually forms from the top down and it hasn't met the bottom yet. So you are floating. We're floating on water? Wow. You're, there's water <laughs> down impressive. there somewhere. So Emily, what is the difference between a bog and a fen? They are related types of wetlands. Both have peat soil, but bogs have no water coming from anywhere except for rainfall. And fens have either groundwater or a little bit of surface water flow through them. So bogs are very acidic, very low nutrients. Fens can have more nutrients and more oxygen coming in from the extra water. Hmm. Now, Emily, is this the pitcher plant right here? This is, absolutely. One of the coolest plants in a bog. So this is the leaf of a pitcher plant. I see something in there. Pick it. Yeah. So pitcher plants, because they live in such a low nutrient habitat, they are carnivorous and they catch bugs to get the nitrogen that they need. Can you open this for me? Yeah, sure, no problem. So we'll pour out the liquid that's in the pitcher plant and see Yum. what we can oh, get with wow. it. Oh, so you can see it was lucky today. There's a couple flies. One is only partly dead. And is this? Yeah. So that big larva at the top is a flesh fly larva. Ooh. And the parents actually drop it in alive already. They don't get laid as eggs. Uh -huh. They start out as larva. And it tears all those things to shreds at the top of the pitcher plant. What? And throughout the water column, there are other insects that have their own niche. So these little white wiggly guys are mosquito larvae and they are filter feeders. So they have little brush-like hairs on the sides of their mouths that they use to filter out all the pieces that the flesh fly larva um, filter leaves and filters down through the water column. And the coolest thing about the pitcher plant mosquito, besides the fact that it can live in this weird environment, is that the larvae get so many nutrients when they're young that the females don't need a blood meal in order to lay eggs. These guys don't bite humans. Oh, um, wow. That's a mosquito you can like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and if I we, appreciate those. And if we dissect the pitcher plant leaf, we might be able to find some more cool stuff way down here. So the very bottom of the tube Oh is God. where oh, <laughs> I know right that's oh. where the midge fly larva live so you can see them squiggling around down there oh, and they clean up the leftovers from the flesh fly larva and the mosquito larva there is some gross stuff down oh. here 
and the cells of the pitcher plant down here don't have a waxy cuticle around them, so they can absorb all the nutrients from this stuff really efficiently. So efficiently that it doesn't stink like dead stuff, even though it looks gross. Really? Wow. So the pitcher plant is just one great example of all the different symbiotic relationships that happen in a bog. Just like you've been talking about partnerships elsewhere, a bog is a place for partnerships. Hey Emily, where are we headed now? We are headed to the open pools and to see two more carnivorous plants. Are these all cranberries we're looking at? They are bog cran cranberries. Oh man, can we taste them? Absolutely, they're not quite ripe yet. <laughs> Find a good one. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Ooh. Oh, they're good. Yep. I'm gonna have another one. You're right, they're not right yet. <laughs> Let's keep right. going. I just wanna stay here all day. Okay, come on, Andrew. <laughs> Let's go. Coming over here, I wanna show you something. So these yellow flowers are horned bladderwort. So on their roots, they have little traps for insects. The traps are little capsules and the plant can actually pump all the water out of them. It creates a vacuum. And then there's trigger hairs on the door to the little trap. And when something swims by, it opens up the capsule. It, the vacuum sucks the water in and it sucks the little microcrustacean in too. Then digestive enzymes like protease decompose the insect and the plant gets phosphorus from it. So what else is cool is that the plant will send carbon from photosynthesis into the water that's around it and it harbors a community of bacteria that attract the micro crustaceans it needs to eat. Wow. <laughs> Can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got it. I'm not leaving you so well. <laughs> I really can't get out. <laughs> Come on. There you go. You might want to go further in. <laughs> Check this out. Oh, wow. We have one more carnivorous plant. So this little guy is a round leaf sundew, which is a carnivorous plant. And it has these red gland tipped hairs on its leaves. The longer hairs have a little tip of sticky nectar on them to attract insects. So an insect will land and it, the, the sundew that it's named for will capture the insect and the leaf will actually start curling around the insect, and then there's shorter hairs that have digestive enzymes on them. So the leaf will curl around the insect and digest it, and then the nutrients from the insect will get absorbed through the leaf cells. That's incredible. Wow. That's May I see it? And I've heard that each leaf can only capture one insect in its lifetime. Wow, look at that. Round leaf sundew. Hi. Oh. I got you a flower. Really? Yeah. I'm kind of scared of it if it's carnivorous. Is it going to eat me? I don't think so. Uh, I guess I'm not a she little She said bird. it eats no. little insects. And so. <laughs> actually, even though that's beautiful, that isn't the flower. So sundew have a little white flower, very delicate, and it's on this tall stalk. Why do you think that is? To attract bugs. Right, so that the bugs that's attracting to the flower don't accidentally get eaten by the leaves. <laughs> well, at least they're considerate of that. It is important to their survival. Check out this plant. Because bogs are such harsh, nutrient-poor environments, the plants that live here need help in order to survive. Leatherleaf is one of the most common species in bogs and fens, and it's a member of the Iracaceae family. They have a speci specific suite of mycorrhizal fungus that attaches to their roots and helps them absorb nutrients from the soil. Michael who? Mycorrhizal. Myco is fungus, rhizo is root, so it's a fungus root relationship. Almost all plants have a mycorrhizal relationship with a fungus. For these plants, it is really important because of the harsh environment of a bog or a fen. 
So one of the most amazing things about bogs and fens as peatlands is that you never know how far the bottom is from where you're standing. <laughs> so I have a, a very unscientific type of bog probe. Do you want to see how deep it is? Yes. Yeah. All right, so each of these is four feet in length. Would you hold those yeah, for no me? Yeah, no problem. And actually, would one of you try and push this through? Sure. It's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> Oh, oh, that's a pleasant sound. Sounds sow. lovely. <laughs> so just all the way? All the way, and then we'll screw in the next one. These are the handles for a chimney sweep brush, and so they screw together nice and securely so you don't lose one at the bottom of the bog. All right, I'm going to give it a go now. What? Can you feel where the resistance stops? Have I you hit water yet? Yes, I did. Nice. Now we have to try and find the bottom. Okay, so let's screw right, some more. Screw another one in. Where's <laughs> your pole? I think we should let Selena do it. So if we lose the pole, we can blame it on her. Hmm. But I'm not gonna lose it. <laughs> Push it up. Yeah. That's the bottom. Wow, that's pretty cool. I think we should find a geologist to figure out how bogs and fens form. Okay, so while we're looking for a geologist, our Great Leaps Adventure will be right back. For more information on today's show, go to aquakidstv.org. Want to keep up with our adventures? Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. You know, Emily said we would be able to find a geologist out here. Where are we going to find a geologist out here? Hi, I'm Tom. I'm a geologist. No way! <laughs> yeah, I'm a geologist. I'm out here studying how fens and bogs form and why they're here. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing my probe down in here, like this, and I'm going to sample to see what's in here. Like that. You see the bubbles coming out? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Some of that might be methane, actually. Okay, let's see what we got. All right, in the probe we have a little bit of preserved sphagnum from underneath. This stuff is no longer alive because the fen is growing from the top up. This is older material and there's a lot of carbon in there, okay, because it's just stored organic material. And if you compare this to what is in the forest, there's a lot more stored here because what happens in the forest is there's decomposition. Decomposition is much slower here, so these things fill up, all right. And the way it got here originally was at the end of glaciation, when ice was melting out of here, the glacier left a big block of ice here, right? And it was surrounded with sand and gravel as the glacier melted. And then finally, when that block of ice left, when it melted, it left this hole, and that has been filling up with organic material ever since. So that's what's underneath us here, is lots and lots of organic material like this, and worldwide, Fens and bogs hold 200 billion tons of stored organic material. And that's a lot of organic material, a lot of carbon that isn't in the atmosphere, but is in bogs. Why is it important that carbon is stored in bogs? If it wasn't stored in bogs, then it would be decomposed and it would go into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide and methane. And you know why we don't want that. Greenhouse effect, right? Yes, yeah, that. that's right. Uh -huh. So, storing carbon is very important, keeping it in the earth, keeping it in bogs and fens like this. How much carbon is actually in this fen? There's a lot in here, and worldwide there are 200 billion tons of carbon stored in fens and bogs. So what we just dug up, that was all the old sphagnum moss, right? But all this red moss that we see here, is that the newer sphagnum moss? Yes, that's the stuff that's living on top. This is the old stuff underneath, it's dead and stored. So Tom, the peat moss you buy in the store, is that a problem? Yes, it is, because what happens is the peat is mined from areas where that has been stored for a long time in the ground. And when you dig it up, it's just like any mining of fossil fuels. You dig it up and you use it, you burn it or put it in your garden, and it turns into carbon dioxide primarily, and that goes into the atmosphere where it causes warming. Now, what we have here in this fend is over 10,000 years of accumulated organic material sitting right here in this fen. And we'll be right back with more on our Great Lakes adventure.
I'm Jeremiah, and this is Earth Edition. From the smallest creek to the largest ocean, we all know the importance of water to life on Earth. Each body of water plays a critical role on the Earth's ecosystem. Wetlands are areas of land that contain water for at least part of the year. There are different types of wetlands based on where they are located, what types of plants grow there, and the soil composition. The four types of wetlands are swamps, bogs, fens, and marshes. So no matter where you live, protect and preserve both land and water because they are dependent upon each other for the life they support. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. From Forest Lodge to the name of Coggin Fen, the biggest thing we learned today is that communities need strong partnerships to survive. And in the great words of High School Musical, we're all in this together. And we'll see you next time on Aqua Kids as the Great Lakes adventure continues. So there's water under here, right? It was great working with the Aqua Kids today. I love getting people excited about bogs, and I'm so grateful that the Aqua Kids are going to get even more people excited about bogs and fence. It's great to see the Aqua Kids out there studying and sharing the importance of water because water connects all life. 